It's just a, a permanent uh, state of condition, I guess. Yeah. I'm, uh, you, can, I'm used to... you can hear us okay? Yes, I yeah. <laughs> Yes, and I can hear you very well. I'm, ask, I'm asking Dr. Mishra. Oh, hi, Bill. Yes, I can hear you okay. Okay. Hello. Just to make sure, sound checking everybody who's speaking. Hi, hi Niels, long time. So, and it looks like there's people in the room there. That's good. I received a message a few seconds ago from Henriette Esterhuisen, who is our on-site moderator, saying that she was going to be, uh, that she's running a little late, but that she thought she would get there in time. But if, uh, if she's not there in a minute or two, I will um, start and then she can take over. And once, uh, is just arriving. Once she arrives, get seated. It looks like uh, Wolfgang is there. Yes, yeah, and Wolfgang is, is there and not well. seated at a table. Um, and not on camera. Wolfgang, if you're hearing this, could you can maybe sit where people can see? Okay, he seems to want to sit in the audience with the microphone. I don't understand that. Um, so the, all the online speakers are here and all the on-site speakers are not. So what do I make of that? Um, we have 25 participants and it is the top of the hour. This is when we're supposed to be starting. I'm Bill Henriette here. I'm, oh, Henriette, you are there. Where are I'm you? I'm here. You're not on camera. I'm sitting at the table. You've got quite a full room. Um, I suggest you start. Oh, uh, you want me to start? Okay. Um, but Henriette, could you maybe get the three of you who are there to sit in front of a camera? I will try. So can I invite the speakers to come and sit here? And then it's easier for the the camera person to keep us in focus. Well, I just need to. Andrea, plug in your sound is very, very low for some reason. Um, I'm afraid that's out of my control. I think we have to ask the Zoom. Wolf Wolfgang, could you speak for a second? Yeah, can you hear me? Barely. Good. Could you guys maybe talk to whoever is doing the <laughs> yeah, technology I, I in the room? Yeah, I can't speak louder, certainly. That, uh, yeah, because you're very hard to hear. Um, Henriette, given the... We're not hard to hear in the room, and neither are you. Um, so I think we should just... Um, uh, whoever is controlling the Zoom to see if they're able to do anything. Can the other uh, remote participants hear us? They say they can. So someone well, in the- We, in we the can room. hear you, yes. It's just that you're quiet. You're much quieter than the people who are online. Okay. All right, that being the case then, Henriette, would you like to start? I'm afraid not because I have to plug in my computer because my battery is dead. So um, I would really appreciate it if you can start. Sorry, I had to rush straight out of another session. So Bill, I okay. would appreciate it if you can get us going while I set up. All right, fine. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, this is a day zero event on internet fragmentation. Um, and uh, concepts and their implications for action. Um, I am William Drake from Columbia University, uh, and I'm uh, the sort of instigator of this event. I am the online um, moderator, uh, and Henriette Esterheisen, who's there in the room, will be the on-site moderator, and hopefully together we will be able to bring people into the conversation from both the virtual and the physical worlds. Uh, so just introduction. So um, I'm director of international studies at the Columbia Institute for Teleinformation, and teach at Columbia Business School, and am a longtime participant in internet governance issues, including the IGF before it existed. Um, Henriette Esterheisen is senior advisor on internet governance to the Association for Progressive Communication, and convener of the African School of Internet Governance. And walking around right now, she was the MAG chair from 2019 
2021. She's based in South Africa. Neha Mishra is an assistant professor of international law at Geneva Graduate Institute. She reaches, researches international legal issues in the digital economy, focusing on international economic law, data flows and di uh, digital trade, and the interface of trade law and emerging digital technologies. Milton L. Mueller is professor in School of Public Policy and School of Cybersecurity and Privacy at Georgia, Georgia Institute for Technology in the United States, not Georgia as a country. He is the director. Somebody's speaking at the same time. So whoever has got their mic on, turn off, please. It's much harder to connect to us. Could, could people, whoever is having the conversation unrelated to the panel, please mute your mic. Can the host uh, mute them? It's a uh, Siva Thank you. Now you're muted, Bill. This is fun. Uh, so, uh, yes, I just introduced Milton. Wolfgang Kleinvector, Professor Emeritus from the University of Aarhus, founder of the Summer School of Internet Governance, former ICANN board member, commissioner in the Global Commission on Stability and Cyberspace. Uh, Sheetal Kumar is the head of global engagement and advocacy at Global Partners Digital. Her portfolio covers GPD's policy areas, trust and security, online content and emerging technologies. She is the co-convener of the IGF Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation. Andrew Sullivan is president and, and CEO of the Internet Society. He was appointed to that position in 2018 and he's worked on internet issues since 2001 and has been uh, chair of the Internet Architecture Board. Peju Zhu is a professor and director of Global Internet Governance Studies, uh, oh, director of the Global Internet Studies uh, Center at the Communication University of China. His research interests include international communications, governance, and cybersecurity. He's authored three books on geopolitics of internet governance. Okay, so let me say a couple of words by way of background about what we're doing here. And then uh, I will begin by throwing out some questions to the panelists to initiate conversation. And from there, we will uh, go around for 50 minutes or so uh, and then open it up to the floor uh, to all participants to weigh in. I see we have about 45 people, so we should have a good basis for an interesting conversation. Um, and again, uh, Henriette, okay, you're, you're back in place, but okay. Fine. So Henriette, and Henriette's there, and she will manage the uh, the uh, the side of things in Addis. So so just to, to frame this discussion for a few minutes, um, internet fragmentation is not a new topic, of course. Since the 1990s, there's been a lot of discussion about the tensions between territorial authority and the internet, borders and cyberspace and all that. But in 20, the 2010s, the term fragmentation began to appear um, and uh, be applied to government barriers and various technical misfires and so on. But there was really a boom of interest in the topic after Snowden in 2013, and a lot of debate about fragmentation and splinter nets and balkanization and the EU constructing a Schengen cloud and all these things. Uh, there was in this context then the Montevideo statement from the leaders of the I-Star organizations uh, warning about fragmentation, the Netmundial statement that we all agreed in 2014 talked about fragmentation. Uh, various people began to write stuff on it. The World Economic Forum uh, ran, a process, ran a process that, well, I ran it for them uh, for a year. We did a couple of sessions in Davos and put out a paper with uh, Bitsurf and Wolfgang and myself. Uh, Milton uh, wrote a book about it. And so, so there was this growth. But now in the past two years, the topic has really exploded like crazy. Expressions of concern and calls to action on fragmentation have moved up the international political agenda. We're seeing statements and initiatives from the White House in the United States, the European Union and its members, the UN Secretary General, who's made it a central theme of his uh, digital uh, global digital compact discussions, various statements and analyses by internet technical community bodies, a flurry of academic papers, conferences, discussions, et cetera, um, a policy network in the IGF, as I mentioned, that's been formed in 
think about these things. And what's notable in all of that is that there's no concession, consensus on what fragmentation is and is not. In fact, there's sharp disagreement uh, and a lot of people talking past each other. It's, uh, it's a kind of a Tower of Babel type situation, which is familiar to those of us who are internet governance veterans. Uh, there's a lot of parallels, I would argue, with the internet governance definitional debates 20 years ago, uh, before and during the, the World Summit on the Information Society, or WISIS. If you remember back then, people were talking past each other about what is internet governance from various angles. Some people uh, had a very narrow understanding of internet governance as being just about the management of the infrastructure, particularly identifiers in the root zone file. Uh, and some people said, okay, that's ICANN. And then there were some people who said, well, it should be the ITU who does that. Then there was a broad definition kind of approach that included not just the infrastructure, but rules pertaining to the usage of the internet for information communication and commerce. And the sort of simple binary emerged in a lot of conversations of governance of the internet versus governance on the internet. Um, and there's sort of the same kind of discussion happening today with fragmentation. There are a lot of people who take a very narrow view that fragmentation only can uh, apply to the term, uh, uh, to a total rupture of the technical infrastructure while others take a broader view and see fragmentation originating from a variety of technical conditions and government business practices that block interoperability and data flows between willing partners and so on. Um, so we have, again, this kind of narrow, broad debate going on, and it matters uh, how issues are discussed and institutionalized um, on the international agenda matters to outcomes, to real world behavior. I'll just give you uh, two quick examples. Uh, in 2005, the Working Group on Internet Governance that was appointed by Kofi Annan to come up with a definition of Internet Governance, when we had our first meeting, the IT Secretary General came and told us that we have to adopt a narrow definition and that this by extension should mean that the ITU is in charge because it does infrastructure. But the WIGIG instead adopted a, a report that had a broad definition, made clear that IG was multidimensional process involving many actors and institutions, and it only mentioned the ITU once in a footnote. And the whole kind of ITU versus ICANN aspect of the WISIS battle kind of abated after that. Um, similarly today, we have uh, the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States is a very influential group of uh, policy types, came out with a big report on confronting reality in cyberspace, foreign policy for a fragmented internet that says that because of internet fragmentation, U.S. policies promoting internet openness and freedom have all failed, and the U.S. should shift towards a great power competition mindset on all internet matters. But the report never defines what fragmentation is. It never says how strong it is, uh, why it should, uh, what exactly is being impacted by it, and why this means that there is no global internet and policies for openness have all failed. So, you know, the way people talk about these concepts can be consequential for action. So that's why we want to try and contribute, since this is a fragmentation is a main theme of this whole conference. We wanted on day zero to try to contribute to some thinking about fragmentation, to try to get people who have been working on these issues for a long time and have insights to share some thoughts that might help to frame the discussion going forward. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to do three rounds of questions to the panelists, let everybody kind of weigh in toward the top, and then when we get to like the top of the hour, um, we'll open it up to the floor and get everybody involved. Um, and Henriette, since you didn't get to speak, why don't we treat you as being a panelist as well? Whenever you want to speak to one of the questions, please just join the conversation. So let me ask the panel then to start. Let's talk about what is the state of the debate? There's all, as I said, there's all these expressions of concern, calls for action um, about internet fragmentation. What's your general sense of the current moment of this discussion? Why are we having this boom of interest in fragmentation right now? And is it useful and constructive? Um, and in particular, what's the state of play and debate in your country or region or uh, expert community about fragmentation? Because fragmentation is being discussed in a lot of different ways. Can I ask the panelists to please weigh in on that set of questions to get us going? Who would like to start? I will. Okay. And could you just use the raise raise hand uh, function? It's easier. Okay, Milton, go ahead, please. 
Sure. So I think it's very clear what the state of play is now. I think the reason um, we are this fragmentation, so-called debate doesn't go away is uh, based on the argument that I made in this book, you know, five years ago. Uh, and that is that the fragmentation debate is really one and the same with the so-called digital sovereignty debate. So it's not about diverging standards or technical fragmentation. It's not about walled gardens by private actors. Uh, that isn't happening. The, the uh, internet identifiers have not split. Uh, we still have an integrated DNS. Uh, everybody's still using TCP IP. So what is it really about? It's about a counter-revolution against the globalizing tendencies of the digital political economy. Um, on the one hand, you have this incredible technical interoperability that was created on a global basis by not just the internet protocols and identifiers, but we have an integrated market for software, for semiconductors and digital devices. And this global compatibility gave rise to a global division of labor in ICT protection to a distributed and integrated digital ecosystem. And up to now it's fostered free and open trade in information products and services. Now counterposed against this is the territorial state which wants to border and control the digital ecosystem. Uh, they do this in the name of national security or to protect the subsidized favored constituencies, to gain an advantage in military technology or to engage in espionage. So in my view, the fragmentation debate means answering this question. Do we want to continue to foster the globalized exchanges, competition and innovation enabled by this global compatibility, or do we want to impose the kind of customs borders, taxes, military checkpoints, nationalistic attitudes and barriers to trade associated with traditional nation state governance? Okay, so for you then, uh... To the extent that there's a discussion about fragmentation, it's only about state policy. It's not about commercial practices, and it's not about technical incompatibilities or coding okay. problems and things like yes. that. Okay, uh, Andrew. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I, I think I agree with Milton that um, there is a, a significant part of this that is just um, the attempt by nation states to just sort of re impose uh, their framework on uh, on the networking environment. I think where we disagree is um, the idea that this is not merely, or, or this is not, uh, uh, this is perhaps related exclusively to nation states. Um, uh, so I've been thinking a lot recently about what I, what I've started to call, you know, sort of networking autarky. Um, this idea that the, the you know you can you can be a self-sufficient network of any kind and you and you kind of build a wall around it, and that is true actually of a number of private um, uh, efforts as well as a number of uh, of nation-state efforts. But all of them really amount to the idea that you can you can sort of internet alone, and this is a this is a silly idea. Right. The, the, I mean, the, like it's a terrible, bad idea, but it's it's one that seems to have set in to our uh, to our discussion that you can uh, sort of carve out a piece of, of networking life and then you can have it all on its own. And I think that that idea is what's underlying all of this debate. Um, but I think it's uh, I, I think it's quite a toxic notion because, of course, networking sort of depends on inter interoperation. And we appear to be at the moment where we're trying to give that up. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So corporate corporate behavior is in the mix for you. Who, uh, Neha? Um, yeah, I, I agree with uh, a lot of what was already discussed by Milton and Andrew, but, and I do think that digital sovereignty is often a framing for many of these issues, but at least from a legal perspective, what really interests me is how a lot of domestic laws and regulations um, are trying to interfere with the internet, not always necessarily to fragment the internet, but with the idea of establishing sovereignty. Um, and I think a lot of people discuss about data localization measures, um, and they can be for a variety of policy objectives, and some of them do actually have some impact on the technical infrastructure in the sense that there could be some requirement regarding routing of data through 
maybe not routing of data outside the borders of the country. So I think that's one interface that is also quite important to understand. Uh, my, my claim is not that different regulations mean fragmenting the internet, but it also requires some consideration of how governments are trying to frame different kinds of laws and regulations. So I, I'll just give you one example, that of Cambodia, uh, which recently they passed a decree where they said all internet traffic has to be uh, routed through their national internet gateway, which is controlled by the government. Um, and the idea behind this is purely domestic regulation. They want to control the kind of content that comes in and out of the country. But it, it's not here just about regulatory differences, but it also affects to some extent the infrastructure, the universality of the internet. So I just wanted to flag that as well. Thank you, Neha. I think what we're doing so far, though, is giving our bottom line views on fragmentation rather than addressing the question of why now exactly and what's being discussed in your neck of the woods. So it'd be nice if we could try to do a little bit of both of that. I am not seeing, by the way, I'll come, Peiji, I'll come to you if you want. I'm not seeing uh, the panelists who are there in Addis on the screen. I don't know um, why. Wolfgang is ready uh, to go, Bill. And I was going to uh, um, uh, emphasize what you just emphasized. So far, the panelists have not really answered your question. So I hope Wolfgang and Chital will. Wolfgang's ready to go, Bill. Okay, it'd be really helpful. Oh, there, now I see you again. Okay, Wolfgang, go ahead, please. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And um, the, the key word was used by Andrew, it's the interoperability. So I think the uh, beauty of the network which emerged from the 1970s and 80s was that everybody could communicate with everybody. And w w now we have five billion people online and uh, this is more or less still the unfragmented technical infrastructure of the internet. Bill has referred to the Tunis agenda when we had this differentiation between the technical layer, the development of the internet, and the policy layer, the use of the internet. 20 years ago, the main debate was on the development, on the critical internet resources, domain names, IP addresses. But now I think the big bubble is on the policy layer. So that means the uh, time has changed, and so the relationship between the technical and the political layer has also changed. On the technical layer, we have still the philosophy, one world, one internet. But on the policy layer, we have one world, 190 jurisdictions, or one world and 10,000 different companies, you know, which have their wallet gardens. And that's the problem, how you organize the relationship between the two layers. So I think the dreamers of the 1990s and the early 2000s was that the technical layer will influence the policy layer so that we will move into a harmonized world. But what we have seen the last 20 years with all these political conflicts, that now the application layer uh, moves downwards and threatens the, the technical layer. And in a worst case scenario, you could imagine that you have also in the technical layer 190 national segments. And then you could have a situation like we have in, uh, in, in the travel world, when you move from one country to another country, you need a visa, an entrance visa, or you know, a, a permission to leave your country. So in the internet world, it could be that you need a special password if you want to send an email to another <laughs> server. So uh, the, the world is full of idiots, and some people could, uh, Andrew said it's a very, very bad idea, but uh, do not believe that bad ideas are impossible to implement. There are people in the world who want to implement such bad ideas, and in so far, I think uh, uh, events like the IGF should make a wake-up call so that the public understands the threat which is uh, uh, in the air to, to undermine this incredible achievement that five billion people can talk to each other and on the technical layer. So uh, the good news is that both the um, Declaration on the Future of the Internet, which came out from the White House, and the White Paper, which was published from in Beijing just two weeks ago, uh, use the terminology interoperability as an important element. And as long as this is safe and the 
big two cyber superpowers are agree on this, so we have some hope. But let's wait and see how this will be further, uh, further uh, developed. Thank you, Wolfgang. And, and uh, uh, everyone, please, if the panelists could try to stick to around two minutes, it'll be easier for us to get through the agenda and then open it up to the floor. There are people already raising their hands, itching to get into the conversation, but I'd like to get through the panels first. Um, Peiji, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, Bill. Uh, I think there are these uh, different metrics. Uh, one is the narrow uh, kind of uh, metric uh, you have uh, mentioned, and uh, it's about the technical uh, aspect of it. I'm still using this term uh, to talk about uh, uh, fragmentation. However, I'm observing in China that uh, a lot of uh, uh, my colleagues are using the term fragmentation to talk about the data. Uh, I think, uh, Mishra, uh, you have mentioned about this. Uh, that is about a trend to legalize the digital space. Uh, I think that is led by European Union as uh, uh, the digital sovereignty notion uh, talks about. And uh, Wolfgang has mentioned, for example, about uh, one internet or one word. 193 jurisdictions. I think that notion about data means that uh, the internet has already been fragmented. Uh, I like the technical uh, part of it. I'm also observing, for example, in China, uh, we use the word to talk about the ideological division of uh, cyberspace, for example, dividing the vendors, the equipment, uh, provided into trustworthy or untrustworthy providers uh, and also dividing the uh, applications into trustworthy ones and non-trustworthy ones. Of course, that is not a Chinese notion that is represented by the uh, future, uh, I mean, the declaration for the future of the uh, internet. So there is a kind of ideological division. Uh, and uh, Wolfgang has mentioned about the white paper that China has published, that, that means that uh, a lot of, of my Chinese colleagues are uh, are supporting actually the ICANN system, the technical aspect of it. But uh, we are worried about all the fragmentations in the different layers. Bill? That's very interesting. Uh, good to get a report from uh, a region because so, so much of the discussion fragmentation that I hear is driven out of the US and Europe. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear about how it's being discussed elsewhere. Um, I can't see the panel she, again she who are there, but um, I know that Sheetal and Henriette are on the panel. Yes. Do either of you want to weigh in on this point? She's ready uh, um, to talk. Well, <laughs> okay. Why are you, you not on camera? I don't get it. Um, don't worry um, about it. <laughs> okay, but All right, I can't with see that, um, thank you for having me. Uh, Bill, you, you mentioned that this topic has suddenly burst onto the scene. Um, and I think, you know, if it's been in the past few years, we also have to remember in the past few years, we've had a, another big thing that's happened to us all, namely the pandemic. And I feel like one of the reasons that this discussion has become uh, so much at the forefront of, of discussions at, well, the IGF and also elsewhere is that we have become more dependent on, on being online. More people have become more dependent. At the same time, there is this, um, there we have seen an increase in attempts to, to control um, user, user access. Um, and, and that's taken away control from, from users themselves. Uh, we've heard examples of that. It's, it's happening through policy um, in particular. And I think it's, it's, an opportunity, you know, when you ask, is this a good thing, is it not? I think it's an opportunity for us to defend and promote and rearticulate the values um, that we want to see expressed um, by internet governance, by policymakers, by commercial entities, indeed by all, because there is this underlying assumption, whether you think of the internet as social media experience, you know, we've all heard people say, oh, the internet's gone wild because some celebrity has posted something. I mean it's not the internet that's going like that right but it's people and that we think of it that way because it's such a human centric technology by its very nature um so even if you don't agree with that perception it is ultimately about that and as we move or or 
people cannot use it in the same way in, in, the, in that way it was envisioned. Um, and as more and more people cannot, and as more and more people have that taken away from them, I think it becomes more of a question of what do we do about that. And we have heard uh, examples of how the, um, uh, the technical layer continues to be a space where in theory, or rather in practice really, it, 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 um, data flows, um, can data can flow, it can interoperate, all of that is well and good and functioning. But if in practice and if the experience is not that, and increasingly not that for many, then we will continue to have this conversation in this way. And I think it, we also heard an example of how there can be perhaps inadvertent changes or, or ways that the internet is evolving, including to ensure that people, more people can get online, where those perhaps values or different visions of the internet that we're seeing more um, uh, at the policy layer, if we want to call it that, could also, also I, I think uh, you were mentioning that, Wolfgang, um, we could also see that um, at, at, diff uh, at the technical layer. So we, I think we're having this conversation now because we're all so dependent on it, um, but we're also assuming and desiring that it maintains that vision of being an open space where anyone can connect um, to others and that, uh, that, is, uh, that is changing and that's how people feel about it. So um, I, I hope that's okay to start us off, Henriette. All right. Shito. Thank you very much, Shito. You know, I think, uh, what in particular you flagged there that's helpful is sort of the notion that for a lot of people, fragmentation is about user experience, about what's going on at the sort of layer above the pro protocol stack of uh, whether or not people are able to exchange data and so on, which raises questions about, you know, how do we think about blockages of the internet? Some people think blockages don't constitute fragmentation. Some people think they do. This is a point I want to come back to again. Henriette, do you have anything in particular on how it's being discussed in Africa? I think the only thing I would add here is that what some people describe as manifestation of fragmentation just also often comes from a place of trying to find solutions for, for what is experienced as internet-related policy challenges. So I think I really, I think Wolfgang expressed that well. How do you deal with, um, with, with, with data? data request? How does law enforcement agencies deal with demands for user data that they might need um, to pursue a certain um, uh, investigation? They might be very happy to follow rule of law. They, they, they're comfortable with rule and law. They even respect human rights, hopefully. But it, it's challenging. Similarly, issues of taxation. How, how, how does a country ensure that it generates sufficient revenue from the, um, the, the profit made or the, the operations of global internet companies within their jurisdiction. So I think that there's, there's, um, there's not always a space, it doesn't always come from a space of wanting to uh, disrupt the user experience or wanting to fragment the internet as a whole. It comes from a space of trying to find solutions for what is experienced as problems that are often not very well understood and therefore the solutions often don't really match um, the problem. And the result is the sense of a fragmented approach to, to internet policy and regulation. But Henriette, if I can press you on that just a little bit, that sounds like you're opening the door to a very expansive understanding of fragmentation. If you're saying that people are talking about fragmentation because there are problems on the internet and they want solutions to all kinds of different problems, then pretty isn't there the risk then that the term becomes a catch-all for all kinds of things that don't actually, in other understandings, fragment, segment, separate the internet into spaces, reduce interoperability, and so on? I think it depends who it is that's talking about fragmentation. I think um, different actors and different interest groups are talking about a fragmentation in different ways that reflect their particular priorities. Um, and, 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 you know, so I think if you are a, a company that wants to operate in a borderless wor world where you don't want to be subject to, to national regulation because you're a global company and it's extremely expensive and cumbersome and it doesn't really work on the internet, then any efforts um, to establish national regulation that you comply with, 
you are going to present that as fragmentation because in a sense it does. It, does, it, it fragments your business model. It complicates your business model. If you're a human rights activist who's trying to counter internet shutdowns because internet shutdowns um, um, create it, dist it, it completely distorts the user experience, so does censorship, you're going to cast those as internet fragmentation. So I think we are in this limbo space at the moment where how people, and particularly how state actors, are thinking about the internet is changing, and we are using the language of fragmentation to try and describe our fears um, um, for what the impact could be of this changed behavior, particularly of states. Chattel yeah. wanted to react. I'm I not sure I if I answered your question, Bill. I just wanted to say yeah, um, that w I know we're going to talk about the policy network a bit, a bit more, um, but I wanted to say that in the policy network discussions that we've had, there has also been, as you said, Henriette, a continuous reference to the, to the point that it's not always a it's not always desired, you know, <laughs> like the, the impact. It can be inadvertent, the impact. Um, the point is that perhaps if certain set of situations arise, a certain amount of um, factors um, come together, then the impact can be of fragmentation. Um, and that might, that might be qu simply a question of unpacking that, and I think we are doing that in the policy network, we continue to do that. But the point is, it's not always something that is expected or desired, it can be a result simply of trying to do something to solve a problem. Thank you. Uh, Sheetal, I think it's an important point. I mean, this is something that um, I know in the paper that I worked on, we talked about inadvertent kind of uh, results, unintended consequences versus intentional fragmentation. And there certainly are a lot of people who talk about technical fragmentation in, the, in, that, in that manner of uh, unintended consequences. But let's, it seems like everybody wants to dig right down into the definition stuff more than the what's going on in my neighborhood. So let's really do that. Let's try and do, do another round about what exactly are we talking about here? Uh, when we talk about fragmentation, I mean, what are people's core criteria for deciding what, if anything, constitutes fragmentation? What is being segmented or fragmented from what? Uh, I mean, the notion of fragmentation implies something that was unified or connected becomes broken in some manner. So what exactly is being broken from what? How lasting uh, and structural does that breakage have to be in order to count as fragmentation versus can it be just temporary uh, or short term kind of thing? So I mean, would you count, is, is, for example, if you're talking about um, blocking, isn't there a difference between a great firewall that blocks 1.3 billion people from using a range of apps, uh, platforms, uh, URLs, et cetera, versus a short-term internet shutdown because of political instability that's then restored six hours later. Um, does scope and duration matter in talking about blockage as a form of fragmentation? So what is the really core criteria of what we're talking about here? How do we define this construct? Can I go around the panelists again on this one? Uh, Milton, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. Um, so I do have an answer to that question. You know, I'm the one who really tried to formulate a very precise technical definition of what fragmentation would consist of, because you're right, we do have to pay attention to scope, duration. Uh, we can't just say because, you know, a backhoe cut my cable uh, in, in my backyard and my internet service was down for three hours. Um, that w the internet is fragmented. That's not a systemic view of what fragmentation consists of. Likewise, there are people with perfectly legitimate concerns about other forms of fragmentation that are more products of market competition. In other words, somebody introduces a new version of a browser or, or some kind of modification of HTTP that leads to incompatibility on their computer uh, they maybe have to upgrade their software or something unpleasant like that. Uh, and that is something that, again, I would not call fragmentation uh, unless, again, it is very persistent and leads to a literal a, a fork in some kind of critical 
part of the infrastructural software that is running uh, the internet and most of its applications. And I think we'd all agree that if we had a split domain name root, uh, which people have been predicting for years and has never happened because it doesn't make any sense, uh, that would we would all con consider that to be a fragmented internet. But the reason I think I put so much emphasis on the jurisdictional and legal and political part of it is because that's what's happening now. That's what's really driving the debate. That's why this debate has hung around for so long. And, uh, you know, it's not like this is one of these sort of liberal democracies versus authoritarian states things. We see some of the world's leading liberal democracies, whether it's the US you know, imposing export controls or the Germans imposing you know, national level content controls, uh, all states by virtue of their status as states are pushing towards a kind of a disruption of the global compatibility of the internet. Okay, Milton, just to be clear, and I think your view is clear, but just for the audience who may not have heard it. Um, so you don't, you don't count any of the business type stuff, walled gardens, things like that as, as fragmentation. You do think there are concerns about government policies such as the Great Firewall type thing, but you don't wanna call that fragmentation. You wanna call that alignment. And my question would be, if you have large numbers of people unable to access and use the internet, why is that not an example of fragmentation per se? Well, if the large numbers of people are unable to use the internet because of government action, uh, then definitely that does count as you could call that fragmentation in my view. Okay, okay. then I think your, your position has evolved a little. That's fine, thank you. Um, Andrew. Uh, thanks. So, once again, I both agree and disagree with um, uh, with Milton. Um, uh, it, the the thing that I I mean I, I guess I, I sort of don't care precisely where we draw the line around what is fragmentation versus some other badness that we might you know want to characterize as a different thing. What I think the critical thing anyway for me uh, is. It, it's really that fragmentation or any other sort of drift away from the internet and its fundamental um, uh, approach of interoperating independent uh, networks is, uh, is a problem. So the internet has never been a unified thing, right? Like that is the, the, the idea that the internet is a monolith is a terrible idea. It, it, like it's, it's just factually false. And it's always been false um, from the very beginning of the internet, the very earliest um, uh, networking uh, efforts. There were definitely pieces of it that you couldn't access from every other place on the internet, and that was, you know, that's that's never been a weird thing. The difference is whether we agree that we're trying to interoperate more generally, or whether we're trying to hive off this or that part of, uh, of, of networking for, you know, a given population or for a given uh, group of people or for a given nation state or for a given group of users or whatever. And what I see as a more general problem is this drift away from interoperability as the primary, you know, sort of impulse and towards uh, this kind of enclosure uh, of users, of you know, groups of populations, whether they're commercial users or whether they're, net, you know, citizens of a given country uh, or whatever. And for that reason, I think that, yes, uh, for instance, a, uh, a shutdown for six hours um, uh, is on the spectrum of fragmentation. It's, it, it's, it's along that spectrum. It's perhaps not as bad as, uh, you know, our unit or whatever. But it is um, it is definitely within that within that direction, and it's this conceptual direction of are we are we moving towards interoperation or are we moving away from it? And I think is the way to think about this, not a not a sort of binary um, uh, matter. You know, am I bald yet or am I am I fragmented yet? Not an interesting <laughs> question. It's instead 
you know, am I getting balder? And the answer, by the way, is yes. Um, and uh, am I getting uh, am I getting more fragmented? Also, in the current um, uh, situation, I believe the answer is yes. I very much agree with uh, you on the getting balder part, and but more generally, that uh, fragmentation is to me not a binary on off thing. There is a spectrum. There's a range of different stuff, and here. Milton and I have a fundamental disagreement, and that's fine. Um, and you also have a disagreement with Milton because he's saying commercial practices, enclosures, like you just said, don't count, and you're saying it too. Ne uh, Neha, do you have a thought for us? Um, I think I, I like the framing of spectrum. I think that that's a very good way of capturing uh, different views on internet fragmentation, and I do think it is beyond uh, technical fragmentation. Um, and I'd also like to re-emphasize my point that if governments could, uh, they would use legal devices to also bring about some technical fragmentation. And, and they do, and they do, sometimes very unsuccessfully, but they do. And there have been consolidated efforts in the recent years. And across the world, uh, it's not specific countries that I'm talking about. Um, one thing I'd, I'd like to highlight and drawing a parallel from my area of work, uh, there's this idea of fragmentation in international law as well. Um, and the idea is that international law is getting divided up and there are different uh, there are different kinds of international law that apply to different spaces, so to the economy, to the environment, to society. Um, so I think that that perspective is quite helpful in, in the sense that I think Sheetal mentioned about the user experience of the internet being very different and sometimes in response to policy problems, but sometimes that user experience might give you a very a uh, specific idea of uh, the internet being fragmented. And I think that might be a good lens to look at it as well. And that would tie up to I Andrew's point as well. So for instance, if my entire world is the WeChat world, and that's what I think of as the internet, and that's not how the internet looks like in the rest of the world, uh, just as an example, then that could also be an example of fragmentation. So the idea of spectrum, I think, is a very helpful framing device. Thank you very much, Neha. It was very interesting. Since I can't see the panel, I'm just going to call Peiji, and then we'll turn to folks in Addis, and the three there can just go across. Peiji? Uh, yes, Bill. Uh, I think it uh, may be useful to define, for example, the narrow, narrowest version of internet fragmentation, or we could call it the Milton Mueller version of fragmentation, which refers to the separate rules and the associate and naming and numbering systems. Uh, I think uh, I'm uh, very comfortable with this uh, narrow version. However, I think it, we can also imagine, for example, the broadest uh, version of uh, internet fragmentation, which may refer to, for example, the separation of the global digital uh, system or ecology uh, that uh, consists of, for example, the supply chain of chips consisting of uh, applications, consisting of uh, cloud services, consisting of uh, uh, undersea cables, or consisting of in which country uh, the tech companies are listed or where the data is stored. So uh, I think we can also imagine the broadest kind of uh, fragmentation that uh, uh, that is, anyhow, is a kind of exaggeration of the concept. Bill? Thank you. Let's go, I, again, I can't see the panel, but I, you, I know you're there. Uh, two minutes, uh, please, Mo, uh, Wolfgang. Uh, I'm just going to call your names out in the abstract. Wolfgang, do you yeah. have a thought about, my question was, uh, how, what's the criteria for defining what fragmentation means? What is being split from what? What is being fragmented from what? You know, what can we drill down to a core construct about this? Okay, sometimes it's good to remember history. So I think in the 1990s, the question of fragmentation was the alternate route. But the problem was that the legacy route had millions of users, the alternate route had just 10,000 uh, uh, users, and so the alternate route collapsed. Then in the 2000, uh, the French government introduced the idea of an 
uh, object naming system. They said, okay, the DNS is for the Internet of People, but with the growing Internet of Things, we need an additional and alternate system. And so they introduced the ONS. Remember Bernard Benamou and GS1 and all this. And I think it was during the ITF in Nairobi in the year 2011, 11 years ago, when we had a very intense debate about the uh, Internet of Things and the ONS. And we finally agreed, and even the French government accepted this, that uh, the Internet of Things is just an application on top of the DNS. So the DNS, TCP IP protocol, survived uh, this effort. Then uh, Russia introduced in the Wicked conference in Dubai 2012 the idea of a national Internet segment. It was not adopted by the ITU, but uh, a, a lot of you know, confusion was what is the internet, national internet segment in a globalized uh, infrastructure. So Russia was unable to explain it, but adopted a law which allows Russia to decouple from the global internet. It's a stupid idea, but certainly <laughs> they can do it if they think it's useful for them, but uh, it, it would not have affected uh, the global internet if Russia decouple itself. Now in the Ukraine war, the Ukraine minister wrote to ICANN and asked it to take .ru and .rf and .moscow out of the route. And fortunately, you know, uh, ICANN, uh, uh, you know, was very clear that they uh, support Ukraine and, 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 and understand their position, but they didn't do that. And, and they said, okay, we are a neutral steward of the uh, critical internet resources, and we will not split the route or take some uh, out of the route and, and, and contribute to a, a fragmentation debate. So that means these are some historical experience which show that um, you know, things are happening, but at the end of the day, as Milton has said in the beginning, you know, we have still the TCP IP protocol, we have the DNS, and it's working. So uh, even the new IP proposal China introduced a couple of years ago in the ITU is now more or less, uh, I would not say off the table, but it has uh, taken an interesting development. Now, uh, Chinese papers uh, speak about the, the uh, certain uh, special networks on top of the DNS or, you know, to, to manage the weaknesses of the DNS latency security. So for autonomous uh, 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 cars, for instance, probably, or, or for, for surgeries, uh, you need special networks. But these are special networks and is not mean to the fragmentation of the internet. In so far, you know, sometimes it's very natural that you see the emergence of special networks on top of this. So this is not a danger for the, for the internet. The real danger would come if you would uh, uh, undermine the interoperability. Thank you. Thanks, Wolfgang. Um, let's see, uh, Shital, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to just bring in the policy network um, at this point because we have been having these discussions um, and I would say that it was full of chaos and fog um, at the beginning um, and it perhaps still is in some ways but what we have been trying to do is, is listen to everyone um, and distill from that an understanding or conceptualization of what could constitute fragmentation and I think that as we develop that, and I encourage those of you who can to come on Wednesday to the Policy Network session, which is at 9.30. Um, we are seeing the user experience aspect um, there, as, as well as the, the question around what does fragmentation at a technical layer look like, and is there some sort of intersection around that, and how does the governance of the internet impact um, both of those aspects? And so what we're trying to do with that, I think, is also what we're going to get to, um, and I've been hearing this in the, the discussions, the webinars that have led to this distilled-ish uh, framework, um, is the need to be more specific about what combination of factors, scope, duration, what point on a spectrum would we then qualify something as an instance of fragmentation. It could be, um, on our last call, someone mentioned Perhaps when it comes to user experience, it could be a combination of uh, measures that collectively result in separate ecosystems of um, 
uh, applications and, and, and use that mean that you don't really have access to the global internet in practice. Um, so collectively, um, it's, you know, separate things then result in that. I'm not saying that that's what we're going to come up with and agree on, but there's something around scope and duration and spectrum you've all spoken to, which I think will come up there. So we, um, we I think we have come to this more middle ground position, perhaps, that um, we, we intend to take to you all um, on Wednesday. And of course, there, there are other ways to engage with this. Uh, and hear from you as to whether this is a helpful framework for, for understanding the issue and, of course, working on it and developing solutions where we collectively feel that we need to. I think group efforts to try to sort things can be very helpful. That's what happened with the internet governance definition, too, in a way. So hope this goes well. Um, okay, finally, Henriette. Um, I think we should um, open the floors Okay, um, we can do that. There are um, several people we, who'd we've like We've got to a half an hour left. I, I, in the, uh, yeah, I, I do see that there are some people, I mean, uh, there's been a hand over here from Siva for an hour, uh, and I see people talking in the, the chat as well. Uh, the only thing is I would like to try to make sure that we at least get some input from the panelists on uh, the sort of Lenin question of what is to be done you know, what should stakeholders, civil society, technical community, private sector be doing? What should we gover governments be doing? What's the role of international institutions and agreements? Um, so I hope uh, maybe when we are responding to uh, points raised in the open discussion that maybe we can get some people to add some thoughts on that too. But sure, why not? Let's open it now because there are people. And I, I also have noticed in the chat Quite a few people, uh, um, Dimitri and, and Pedro and others, Karim. Uh, so please, uh, everybody, raise your hand, uh, say who you are briefly, and try to limit yourself to a minute, minute and a half actual question or something, uh, and tell people who your question is to. Okay, uh, Siva, you've had your hand up for an hour, so why don't we go with you? Thank you, and I want to uh, respond to your basic question why are we discussing fragmentation now and so uh, i thought uh, 10 years ago there were signs of fragmentation today there are cracks tomorrow it would be broken pieces if we do not act and uh, so that's probably why uh, it, it's time sensitive now and um, 10 years ago it was one or two geographies that were um, uh, causing fragmentation we were talking about china russia but today, something that uh, many countries do, wittingly or unwittingly, leads to fragmentation. Even in the case of countries that, are, that have a good understanding of internet, it is some legal regulatory measures uh, or taxation measures that uh, uh, unwittingly cause fragmentation. And um, um, particularly, there is a sovereignty concerns and uh, uh, some sort of hunger for surveillance, which is also causing fragmentation. One particular point that I want to mention is that uh, uh, the internet is global. We want it to remain global, uh, but uh, there is no global legal environment in any geography for uh, a global corporation, global internet corporation to function. And uh, there is uh, uh, no global business zone, zone or uh, no offshore uh, zone and uh, the absence of uh, or and even there is an absence of a global judicial process or an internet judicial process these are all what is needed and uh, what needs to be created by the community and uh, the internet organizations to uh, make sure that uh, a global governance process is trusted and uh, there is a suitable framework for uh, global internet. The absence of a framework, absence of that is also a cause for fragmentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Siva. Uh, and um, again, I ask if, if going forward, if when people take the floor, if you could identify yourself uh, and uh, try to keep to like a minute and a half. I'm, I see a lot of people in the room there in Addis, and I want to get people 
included. Henriette, are there any uh, people raising their hands there? Lots of like people. If you give me a moment, I can give lots them Lots of people. The Excellent. Well, let's um, get some questions from lots of people the, in the, the room. group there. So um, I'm not going to give you a minute and a half. I'm giving you no more than a minute. So please, can we have um, this gentleman and then Rahul and then you and then um, the, the hand at the back. Go ahead. Please be brief. Introduce yourself. So we're getting assistance. Our volunteer is here. Who's controlling the camera? Why can't we see whoever's speaking? No one's controlling the camera, and there's no AI in this room. So, so quickly. Uh, right. Okay. So quickly. When Introduce we yourself, so please. Uh, my name is Hossein from Iran. Uh, when we talk about internet fragmentation, we usually uh, make examples of government's action and uh, political authorities. What, like what we have... Uh, seen today about uh, Cambodia, I think uh, Shital mentioned, or uh, about the National Gateway or six hours complete shutdown, Bill pointed out. But what if the global giants like uh, Google, a search engine like Google, which has uh, some sort of uh, monopolistic power, decides for any reason to limit its, uh, the results we see in the its, its search engine for some specific region, for example, or they activate uh, the surface, uh, the safe search for some other countries, like we what we have seen in some countries in Eastern Asia, or uh, an in a satellite internet provider like Starlink. For some regions, they decide to give uh, even somehow free access to internet, or f but for other regions, they limit it because they are negotiating with the governments. What is your idea of those uh, region-wise discrimination of those global platforms. Do you consider them as an example of internet fragmentation as well? Thank you. Thanks for that Hussein, question. That was an excellent uh, question. Let's, Henriette, let's just take a bunch of questions together and then I'll go back to the panel to I was an I was in the process wants. of doing that, Bill, so just give me a little bit of time. I'll hand back to you when I've done with moderating the questions in the room. Rahul, Great, you have I can't the floor. See you. That's fine, trust me. Just no, uh, no, it's well done. <laughs> um, okay, no, it's just uh, about what is and um, what is not fragmentation. I think that's uh, for me fragmentation is when, when you get uh, two different or different responses to the same action in different parts of the network. So the this is as simple as that. And I'm really concerned about. I think I uh, agree with all the points uh, from Milton about uh, what he said and. Uh, what I'm seeing is that uh, many uh, law proposals in different parts of the world, and law that uh, had already passed, that uh, um, s deciding about uh, content removal or blocking, filtering, for different reasons that uh, I will not argue here, uh, but uh, lead to, to actions that are not explained and are based in the in the way that that are described are based on a, a, a huge ignorance about the internet architecture so it's just saying to the to the internet providers or to the platform saying you have to remove this content and in in countries where there are hundreds of isps the big risk is that uh, the s hundreds of different actions can be taken to lead into a, a huge uh, fragmentation um, it's with regard to the last part of the question, uh, what we can do, I think that we need uh, a benchmark. We need in this uh, to develop in this environment uh, some agreement, kind of agreement with governments too, that we can show to the other parts of the of the, of the governments, saying these are the things that cannot be done because these are the consequences, and uh, this I think that's, that would be a great progress if we can do. Thank you. Thanks, Rahul. And Ovi, please, over there, just if you can pass the mic, just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. I'm Laura from Brazil. I'm here with the Youth Brazil for IGF. Thank you for the panel. It was great. I would like to, to ask this. Uh, some of the panelists compared the issues of today with another moment of the history of the Internet, uh, especially uh, from its beginning uh, of the Internet governance and how it, it was possible to to arrange uh, a system 
uh, that work it towards com compatibility, interoperability, and apart from fragmentation. I think Wolfgang uh, mentioned that uh, how we, we manage to make, uh, to forge uh, a system that allowed p five billion people to connect. And I would like to ask, uh, I'm curious about this, this question. Uh, why did it, did, it, did it work back there? Do you guys think why did it work back there and it doesn't work anymore? You mentioned uh, a lot of factors, but I would like to to precisely assume one hypothesis uh, d because of what was discussed here. Did it work back there because the state was not so involved or interested in this in this uh, aspect of uh, policy making about internet? Did it work back there because the internet was not so strongly spread and was not so strongly implicated with political agenda or not? Uh, do you think it's, uh, there are other aspects that, sh that should be highlighted when you compare uh, nowadays and back in the history of the internet and internet governance in general? Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Bill, uh, oh yes, we have the, the last question from the room. Thank you very much. My name is Waisi uh, from Nigeria. Um, I want to follow up to the question that the last two or so had asked, uh, which is to look at another uh, dimension where non-state actors could also uh, provide an impulse for pragmatization. Uh, if you take um, what uh, the new owner of uh, Twitter is doing, uh, is provoking two uh, different responses. On the one hand, many people are leaving uh, Twitter to other smaller um, platforms, and that for me is also fragmentation. But on the other hand, because Erling is basing his policies on raking more profits, it's engineering governments, in particularly in third world country, to say, well, since you want to make much profit out of these subscribers, we also would have to tax you and uh, begin to tax other platform uh, providers and begin to roll out policies that can impact on the, the uh, digital space and therefore contributing to more discussion, more debate, and more resonance of the question of uh, fragmentation. So I'm wondering whether these actions of uh, uh, non-state actors who, whose motive is pr primarily profit uh, can also be put under the satellite as part of the uh, reasons for the resonance of our fragmentation debate uh, currently. Thank you. Thanks, Wazi. Um, well, I think we have two hands here. I see Andrew is ready to respond to some of these questions. Shall we just take the last two hands? We have um, Izan Khan, um, who is with us virtually. So Izan, if you can go very quickly. Um, and then I'm going to give the, the floor back to Bill to moderate us to the end of the session. Izan, you have the floor. Sure, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? We can. Perfect. Uh, uh, Izan Khan, Youth Ambassador for the Internet Society this year. Uh, I just wanted to say very quickly that implicit throughout this entire discussion is the fact that we consider uh, in internet fragmentation to be having negative connotations in a sense. Uh, but the focus of the discussion today has sort of been sort of measuring like how red the sky is without asking the question of why does it matter that the sky is red? Uh, and in the sense, why does internet fragmentation actually matter for us as the user? And I think a very important point is to know that we have something called internet universality based on the Rome principles. We have things like rights, openness, access, and multi-stakeholderism. And I think every single measure that people consider to be fragmentary or not should be evaluated with respect to those principles, because then it'll let us know whether it actually affects the fundamental spirit and ethos of the internet. And then we can evaluate the risks associated with that. So if something, for example, hampers interoperability. Why does that matter? Does it contain the risk that those principles will be somehow violated? And I feel like that would add a very important set of contexts to this discussion right now, because otherwise we can run left, right, and center thinking about fragmentation without considering what the real implications on the user might actually be and whether they are justified or not. Thank you. Thanks, Izan. Okay. Bill, over to uh, you. Thank you. So we have had excellent interventions, six interventions from Siva, Hussein, Raul, Laura, Yusi, and Izan um, on a range of key points. 
And I'd like to just go around the panel and ask them to pick up on whichever ones they want to touch on. And if your comments should bleed into the question of what is to be done, that also would be very good. Uh, I think Andrew had his hand up first. Andrew, go ahead. Uh, oh, thanks. I, I don't know that I did, but um, anyway, I'll talk now. Um, uh, so the, 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 the concern that I have um, uh, about, well, I, I think it, it reflects the, the last point that was just made. The reason the internet expanded the way it did, in my view, and the reason that we have the, um, the internet that we do is because of a shared illusion. We agreed implicitly that what we were gonna do was interoperate. And that was how we got the internet. P people keep forgetting that the internet is not one thing, right? It, it, it's right there in the name, the internet. Um, so it's, it's a network of networks, but we've forgotten that because our experience of it is, is this smooth single thing. And as long as we had in our heads the idea that interoperation was somehow fundamentally the good thing, then we automatically tended towards um, that kind of interoperation. But having, having abandoned this idea um, that the, the, you know, the, the sort of shared goal of interoperation is automatically the one that we're pursuing, we're drifting away from the potential that the internet offers. <clears throat> and what, what's been interesting to me over the last couple of years in thinking about this, excuse me, <clears throat> is that the, the, the internet is, is technically quite robust because of, of, of the way that it, it works, the, the way that you know, things just, you pick them up and they, they kind of work together. But actually, politically, it's quite fragile. It really does depend on this idea that the um, that the pieces uh, you know that everybody's going to assume this same positivity of interoperation, and I think that that assumption is the one that we're um, that that we've been abandoning gra gradually, and so to answer this implicit question that you were asking, um, uh, uh, you know, what is to be done? Either we will re-embrace this idea that interoperation is fundamentally a good thing, and I, of course, believe that it is, or else we're going to lose the internet. There isn't, this, there isn't a possibility of, like, national internet. That's a nonsense idea. What you get when you have a fragmented internet along country lines or along technical, uh, you know, so-called ecosystem lines, they're not ecosystems, they're parks, but set that aside, um, uh, what, what you get is not the internet or not an internet. What you get actually are just separate networks. We had that experience. We had CompuServe, we had Genie. We don't need to reinvent that problem. What we need to do instead is recommit ourselves to the idea that interoperation and interoperability is a fundamental good that leads to better human outcomes. And that I think is the thing that we really need to focus on. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Milton, uh, let's let's try to be uh, also responsive to the specific questions as much as we can as well. Okay, Milton, go ahead. Sure, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I thought the gentleman who in the room who asked the question about the cooperation between uh, the large global platforms and the governments was really hitting the nail on one of the main drivers of fragmentation. Uh, Again, it's a, it's a classic case study of what I call alignment. It is the platforms are saying, hey, we've got um, a globally interoperable platform here. We're connecting people from all over the world. And then the, uh, let's say the Thai government or the Cambodian government or the German government say, hey, we want you, we, we just passed a law and we want you to uh, enforce certain rules uh, that only apply to German citizens, right, or to Cambodian citizens or whatever. Uh, and then uh, we have discovered to our dismay that the platforms are perfectly capable of doing that, that they can, in fact, uh, configure their systems to dis discriminate against and differentiate between users in different parts of the country. Now, there are also subversive and, and uh, heroic ways of avoiding that. You know, you 
see people in China using VPNs to get access to things they're supposed to not get access to. But fundamentally, uh, that's why I think we have this problem. It is, you know, at the first order, the, the biggest issue in fragmentation is uh, this alignment problem in which governments are trying to uh, align their jurisdictional authority with the functioning of the Internet. One other point related to um, the question from uh, the Brazilian woman um, about why things are different now, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's about imaginaries at all. I think what happened is very clear from a political economy standpoint, and that is the governments did not know what was happening. They were taken by surprise. It was a de facto creation of this global space of compatibility before they understood it, before they knew what to do about it. Uh, you look at what was happening in the early 90s and mid 90s and up until about 98, uh, is that we simply created this riding on the back of telecom liberalization and the liberalization of value-added services, which the internet was classified as. So suddenly you had this global interactive space and this new capability and, and before the governments had approved it. If you had asked them to approve it in advance, they probably wouldn't have. And it happened as a default, as a de facto accomplishment. And for the last 20 years, they've been sort of slowly realizing that they have lost control and trying to reassert control. So that's my theory of why things are different now. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Before we drift into the imaginaries discussion, let's go around though and pick up the questions that have already been asked um, because we had six very good interventions. Um, Neha, would you like to, to respond to any of the, the questions that were raised? Uh, maybe I can just briefly respond to the gentleman, Siva, Siva, who first made a remark about global governance or some kind of a global governance solution. Um, I mean, one thing I wanted to just highlight is that internet fragmentation itself is multi-layered uh, in many ways. So the idea of having a single global governance process or institution just responding to all concerns is probably not going to happen. Um, but from my perspective, uh, I think there are certain solutions that international law can offer. Um, I, I think of international human rights law, but also from the perspective of international trade law, um, uh, particularly with now a lot of trade agreements containing rules that prohibit data localization, require cross-border data flows uh, with some exceptions, uh, and it can be a dialogue for another day what those exceptions might actually mean in practice, and also whether the internet governance community feels comfortable with some of these dialogues happening outside uh, the internet world in closed trade organizations. Uh, but uh, I think certainly there is some potential for international law to offer solutions, at least inform certain global governance process, but I don't think it would be a unified solution. And Neha, just, if I could just follow up with you real quickly. In addition to trade agreements, there's also this kind of new set of instruments, digital mm -hmm. economy agreements, which are a bit more uh, expansive and yeah. allow a, a more multidimensional approach. Do you think that those could play a role here? We see a lot of governments, particularly in Asia, pursuing those. Yeah. So I think the digital economy agreements are a better attempt in the sense they they're solely focused on digital issues. Um, they don't, it's not trading apples for digital services or trading, you know, the automobiles for uh, opening up the market, uh, telecoms market. So in that sense, they are a better attempt. Uh, the, the other strong point about digital economy agreements is that they have a lot of building blocks. They are looking at emerging digital technologies. They are looking at best practices. Um, and I think the capacity of these digital economy agreements to co-opt multi-stakeholder processes is far more than traditional trade agreements. So I think, uh, yes, digital economy agreements are uh, definitely can be a game changer, but I'm not sure how many countries outside the Asia Pacific are going to jump onto this idea. Hopefully uh, engage rather than co-op multi-stakeholder. Uh, Peiji, uh, any thoughts? Yes, I, I must, I'm sensing that uh, our uh, audience members or the questions, some of them are worried about uh, 
the state actors, some are worried about the private sector. Uh, and uh, personally, I'm uh, observing that uh, at the moment uh, that uh, many actors, state actors or non-state actors, are accusing each other uh, of having the intentions to fragment the internet, for example. And uh, that leads to a possibility that, uh, for example, one state actor may take a real action to fragment the internet in the name that others are going to do it. And then I'm thinking that if we stick to, for example, the narrow version or the technical version of the fragmentation, we can find actually a solution to that. For example, we can pr propose a principle of no first use or no first to fragment or no first to take action into the language of a global digital compact uh, of the United Nations and make it uh, further uh, up, make it internationally binding, for example. In that case, we can have, uh, we can have uh, somehow a closed circuit of thinking about uh, the technical version of fragmentation. And meanwhile, we can settle some, uh, some uh, disputes or worries uh, from the state actors and the private sector. Bill? Interesting. So arms, like arms control, no first use uh, announcements. That's an interesting parallel. Uh, uh, in the room, <coughs> Henriette, the three of you there want to jump in on the questions that have been raised by the six people? Yes, I think Wolfgang and Chital would like to respond. OK, yeah, Volume I want is bad. to react to the uh, question by the lady from Brazil. You know, 25 years ago, the internet was a technical issue with some political implications. Today is a political issue with a technical component. Uh, 25 years ago, Larry Lessing wrote a good book when he, uh, he argued code is law. So the code makers were seen as more important than the lawmakers. And you could see it now that the lawmakers are firing back. And uh, 25 years ago, this was a million dollar business. Today, it's a billion dollar business. And in so far, it's not a surprise that governments have a stronger look of it. So th the way forward is you need a better cooperation between lawmakers and code makers so that lawmakers and governments understand you know, this uh, technical infrastructure, how it works, the DNS, TCP, IP. But code makers have also to understand national concerns, you know, if it comes to digital taxation or to uh, security issues and, and uh, cyber crime and things like that. So that means the way forward is a better multi-stakeholder collaboration where everybody in his special function uh, uh, you know, works hand in hand, and this needs trust. And unfortunately, this was lost in the last couple of years. That means we have to rebuild trust in the global internet governance ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Yes, thank you. I just uh, wanted to respond to three, I think it's three of the questions in specifically. You asked a question about why now, I think in one word, its power um, and state and com and by the way, I'm not speaking um, as a co-facilitator of the policy network at the moment. I'm just speaking <laughs> from my personal capacity. I think state and commercial power, wh whatever it is, um, there is a power um, that is being exercised in different ways, um, and we're seeing that uh, through the policies and measures that we're talking about here, implicitly or explicitly. But power is fluid. Um, it is exercised in many different ways. We often hear about people power, for example. Um, and I think that as we are talking about this, this topic, really important point that was made earlier is when and how do we act and based on what? And for that reason, reasserting certain values, whether they are around, for example, interoperability and openness, where we are seeing a shift away from that. Um, and using spaces like the compact, the global digital compact, like the UN, also at the national level, to reassert those values. And values have a material impact, and there is no better, um, I think, example of that than the internet itself. So if we continue to um, reassert the importance of those values and perhaps create and define a framework where we can measure um, where uh, certain measures, whether they're by state act, by you know whatever actors they are, commercial or otherwise with power, have, 
then um, I think we can continue to shape, and I hope we can, the open internet um, that, that we, we all want to see. Um, and we had an example there of the Rome principles as a framework. We have the international human rights framework. You know, there are frameworks that we can assess against. So um, looking forward to continuing this discussion at the rest of the week. Again, really encourage you to come to the, the sessions on Wednesday about this topic as well. Thank you. Um, thanks, Bill. I'll just, just make my sort of last remarks and then I'll hand it on to you. I think I, um, you know, what a lot of what was said really resonates with me. I think um, Andrew's remarks, I think, are really to be taken seriously. We, 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 the value and the, the, the goal of an interoperable internet conceptually informed how we approached inter internet governance initially. And I think we are losing that. I would add another concept to, to it as well. It's not just about interoperability, technical interoperability. It's also about interconnection and interconnectedness. The power of the internet to connect people, to connect content, to connect countries. Um, and I think that, that, that um, this might um, not be at risk of fragmentation at a technical level. We still have interoperability. But I don't think we should underestimate the impact of, of the kind of ideological fragmentation um, the kind of ideological polarization that Pesci talked about, um, the power of the lawmakers over the code. I, I, I don't think we should underestimate that. I really think that, that um, by taking this interoperability, this conceptual and technical and philosophical interoperability and interconnectedness for granted, um, we are putting it at risk. And I do I agree with what Chital and others have said now as well. We need instruments, we need to, the project of multi-stakeholder inclusive governance of the open internet is actually, I think, only just starting. And I think that, that for me is what we, 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 we've been playing around. Now we really actually, ha actually have to, to ensure that internet governance and the way in which policy and re regulation is being made um, does not um, put this interconnectedness and um, interoperability at risk. Back to you, Bill. That is the most optimistic end, end point I've heard in a long time, Henriette. Uh, I'd like to believe that we're just starting uh, with multi-stakeholder rather than hitting a wall. But uh, uh, just we've got five minutes left, and we had uh, previously uh, Niels had raised his hand, and several people were responding to him in the chat. Niels, are you still here to pose your question or no? Of course. No, no, more than happy so, but uh, Henriette's point okay. was, was so happy because it meant that we will be discussing this for many more years as we've been doing for quite some time. I just wanted to add like a, a, a relatively short historical note and that's that fragmentation, interoperability and interconnection are a spectrum that has been going on in transnational communication networks since the telegraph. That was technically why the International Telegraph Union was established in 1865, right? So we're, uh, uh, we, I think we should really make sure that what we're seeing now and also the emergence of oligopolies and monopoly monopolies, uh, monopolies that align with state interests, we've seen this in the telegraph, we've seen this in radio, we've seen this in television. So, but we at the Internet Governance Forum and as internet people tend to think that we are the first ones to go through this. But no, we have done this. But also this internet thing that we're talking about is not completely the same thing all the time. Because the original end-to-end -end principle kind of went overboard with the introduction of network address translation, when not all endpoints could be uh, 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 accessed at the same time. So that introduced the difference between clients and servers, between users and producers, but also uh, IPv4 and IPv6 are not interoperable. It's not all TCP IP anymore because now we also have QUIC. So like this whole understanding that it's one net, one homogeneous network with one homogeneous stack is also not true. But previously there were also interconnecting networks that ran on different stacks. That's what SendMail servers did. That they translated between different networks. So even fragmented networks can be made to interconnect. So there are a lot of ways to introduce political and technical friction that can also be overcome in different ways. So we just need, a, I think, a better understanding of the way in which states 
corporations and technologies continue to reconfigure the relations uh, among each other. And for that, we, of course, we do not just need international relations or technology or economy, but an integrated understanding of both on all levels. And for that, we need several perspectives. And for that, I'm super grateful to have learned from you. Well, thanks, Niels. You, but you didn't set off the uh, uh, socio-technical imaginaire bomb that was going to make uh, Milton's I, head explode. So I, yeah, yeah, but, but that's I OK. I don't want to. So, so OK, so then one well, more thing. So, <laughs> Okay, so we got together around this idea that we're going that more internet is good and that more connectivity is good for everyone. And this was a very like end of eighty nine thing, and the internet was as, was of course like invented as a response to the launch of Sputnik, and then with the fall of the Soviet Union and the Washington Consensus, there was the idea more connectivity is good for everyone. But now we've also seen, as Chital said, with a power analysis there is power between different actors. So this whole idea, this imaginary that got everyone, that more connectivity is good for everyone, has actually limited application. And socio-technical imaginaries don't really take this materiality into account. We should really try to understand what are these different technological configurations that reconfigure relations between users, the market, and the social sector. Okay, so ending on a social constructivist note, uh, that's fine. We have, uh, we, we can leave this for the debate among the academics. Listen, we have one minute left, so let me just uh, give a closing and say, I think this was a very useful uh, and fulsome conversation involving a lot of people from around the world, which is always an excellent thing. Uh, of course, we did not resolve anything, but perhaps we bounded the range of disagreement in a little bit more self-conscious way. And so that's useful. I hope everybody found it uh, helpful. There have been other sessions uh, before recently. I mean, I just did a, um, a webinar on fragmentation a week ago uh, at Columbia. That's on the web as well. And Sheetal mentioned that she's got a session coming up uh, with the Policy Network at IGF. There's a main session and there's a number of workshops. So conversations on fragmentation will continue. Um, and hopefully we will come to some greater level of convergence uh, or at least uh, principled disagreement. Thank you all very much for your participation. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the people in the room. I hope you had a good time. And uh, au revoir, arrivederci, and until next time. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank you.